right, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. We finished our study through the book of Haggai, and it uh, seems fitting to jump from there to the book of Malachi. If you're looking for it and not sure exactly where it is, uh, you can just go to the book of Matthew right there at the beginning of the New Testament and turn left, right? And you'll get, uh, you'll get, it's the last book in the Old Testament, last word from the Lord before a period of uh, silence, about 400 years that God does not speak to his people. And so uh, this is going to be the final word, really uh, a, kind of a closing of the door of the Old Testament, an opening door to the New Testament. And uh, it is what we would call, again, a post-exilic book. And, and hopefully by now you know what that is. It's a, like Haggai in the fact that it takes place after the period of Babylonian captivity. Remember, God's people, uh, by their idolatry, brought judgment upon the nation. God sent them into exile under the uh, kingdom of Babylon. Uh, who, and, and for 70 years they were there until God set them free by a foreign king, a Persian king named Cyrus. And now, back in the land, they begin to rebuild the temple uh, but there was some opposition that, that, that kind of got in the way. And that's when Haggai stepped in. Right? And, and Haggai got the work kind of fired up and restarted. It took them four years to build the temple. And now as we come to the book of Malachi, we're about 75, approximately 75 years uh, from the time that the book of Haggai ended. All right? So a, a couple generations have come since the book of Haggai. And it seemed at like the end of the book, there was revival taking place, right? There was a lot of excitement over the building of the temple. Uh, but we're going to see when we come to the book of Malachi that uh, things have not gone well since. Uh, the people have grown cold and hard towards the Lord. Now, they're still busy practicing their religion, and we'll certainly see that as we look at, at the book of Malachi, but their hearts are not in it. And that's a real danger, is it not? There's a real danger for people to gather in church, but your heart not really be here. And, and, and so we're going to be challenged as we look at the book of Malachi. Um, as far as time frame, if you're familiar with the book of Nehemiah, uh, they were contemporaries, took place around the same time frame. Um, they don't mention each other, don't talk about each other, and it's, it's very likely that uh, Malachi prophesied during Nehemiah's absence. Right? At the very end of the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 12, he goes back to Persia right, to serve the king. And we don't know how long he's gone, but in chapter 13 he comes back. And the things that Nehemiah deals with when he returns are very similar to what Malachi is prophesying against here in this book. All right, so even though they don't mention each other, they were dealing with the same issues, same problems, around the same time. And, and we don't know a lot about Malachi. Uh, we, we don't know much about who he is. Uh, really, all we know is his name. His name means my messenger. Uh, we don't know where he came from. We don't know his background. We do know this. He is a messenger of the Lord. Uh, and so let's look at our passage here this morning. we got a lot of ground to cover. We're introducing a new book. Right? we we got some weighty material to deal with as we look at our passage. And we're going we're gonna to celebrate the Lord's table together this morning. So if you did not get um, your little communion cup as you came in, make sure you do that. You can do that now. But we're going to look to the Lord in prayer as, after we read our passage here. Malachi chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will re rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this time that we can gather this morning in your house to worship your name. As we do so often, we acknowledge that you alone are worthy of honor and glory and praise so we sing to you, and we pray 
to you and we give thanks to you. And now we come because we want to hear from you. And so, Father, we ask that you would speak and as your people that we would hear your word as it is in truth the very word of God. Oh God, guard my mouth, guard my lips that I might proclaim only what you would have me to and nothing more. And Father, we believe there's power in your word, that it is living and it is active. And, and we pray as your word goes forth today that you might accomplish your purpose in us. Lord, that you might encourage and strengthen your people, that you might convict and rebuke where it's needed. Oh, nothing is hidden from you, Lord. You see us, you know us. And Lord, we pray that you might work in us through your word today, by your spirit. Lord, perhaps there are those listening in today or those in this place who are yet without Christ. And Father, we pray today through the proclamation of your word and by the power of your spirit that you might draw them to yourself. Oh, how we long to see new life and new birth in Christ. And we acknowledge this is your work, and so we leave it in your hands. But we ask it all that you might be glorified, Lord. May you be exalted today, not only here, but all around the world as your word is proclaimed. May your glory fill the earth. May your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray in Jesus' name. And amen. So Malachi is, is proclaiming God's word to a people who have grown cold and calloused. Right? They, they question God's love for them. Uh, they're careless in their worship. They're faithless in their marriages, and they have been disobedient to the covenant that they have made, and they are tight-fisted in their giving. And, and so, again, we see, see the, how quickly things change over a couple generations, and there's really a danger, right? Some of you are sitting here this morning, and your grandma, your grandpa, they love the Lord, right? They were on fire for God, but you're sitting here today, and your heart is really cold and hard towards Him. I mean, yes, you do you go to church and you do Christian things because that's part of your life and it's what you do, but it's not really real for you. Not like it was for grandma and grandpa. That happens. It happens all too often right? that we get caught up. And so Malachi is going to bring the word of God to this people to awaken them out of their dead religion. Right? Out of the coldness of their heart. And, and as we work our way through, I want you to ask yourself a question. Right? Each week as we kind of look at the book of Malachi together, I want you to ask yourself, how do you respond to the word of God? Right? What's your attitude towards him? What's your attitude towards his word? What impact does it make on your life? When God speaks, how do you receive it? How should we receive the word of God? Listen to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66 too says, All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. How should we receive the word of God? When God speaks, do you tremble? Do you feel the weight of the word of God as it is proclaimed, as you pick it up and you read it for yourself? This people do not. What we're going to find as we walk through this together is they question God's word. They dispute God's word. And, and, and the, the purpose behind Malachi's letter is that they would fear God and they would tremble before his word. When you come to the end of the book, in, in Malachi chapter 4, we see that phrase over and over. In verse 16, it says, Those who fear the Lord spoke with one another. Or, I'm sorry, that's, that's chapter 3. But in chapter 4, in verse 2, it says, You who fear my name. This is, the, this is the purpose behind Malachi's prophecy. That this people would be moved from this cold, calloused religion to a real fear of God. This is the beginning of wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord. How do you respond to the word of God? Do you tremble? And, and make no mistake, that's what this is. 
Verse 1 says, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. God is speaking to his people through the prophet Malachi, but he is speaking, and this is his word to his people. Malachi is God's messenger. And, and so he's bringing God's message to this people, his people, but as he brings a message to this people at this time, we understand that this word is also to us. You say, how can that be? You know, preacher, this, this was an old word, right? Thousands and thousands of years old. How can it be to us? Because we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? It, it, it's, it's good for you and I as well. When God, when you open up this book and you read it for yourself, God is speaking. Some of you don't do that near enough. God speaks through his word. And when you come to church and you sit down and the word of God is open and someone proclaims the word, it is his word. I wonder how you receive that word. Listen, it's interesting here. He uses the word oracle in our ESV, uh, but the word is, is translated a burden. In, in your KJV, it translates that way, a burden. <laughs> you know, why would God characterize this word as a burden? I, I think there's several reasons, honestly. You know, number one, because the word of God is never light. The, the word of God is weighty and serious and heavy. And we're going to deal with some heavy things this morning. Let me ask you, when, when the word of God is read, when the word of God is proclaimed, do you, do you sense its weight? You know, the word of God should never be taken lightly. There are times that I stand here, listen, my word is not important. I know that. Right? <laughs> Some people think I, I just like to talk to talk. I don't. But you know, sometimes as the word of God is being proclaimed, I can see people checking their phones, passing notes, laughing and joking, <laughs> far off somewhere else, <laughs> right? Somewhere else. And God's word is being proclaimed. And when that is happening, we're not feeling the weight of God's word. We're receiving it lightly. We're taking it lightly. God forbid that we should, we should receive it in that way. I'm not asking you to listen to me. But if God's word is being proclaimed, then you better pay attention. It's weighty. It's heavy. And then secondly, it's, it's characterized a burden because of, because of what happens Whenever it's placed upon the messenger, right? When, when God gives his man a message, there's a weight to it. He chooses Malachi to carry it, and it's as if like Malachi can't wait to get rid of it. Right? Like, I gotta, the, the weight is so heavy. Malachi would not choose this word. He would not choose this message. Why? Because it's, it's intense. He's going to go before God's people, and he's going to say some hard things. And so it's a bird in the sense in which Malachi must, he must take that burden and deliver it to the people. And anyone who proclaims the word of God, whether you're standing behind the pulpit or you're teaching a Sunday school class, you should study it in such a way that, that God speaks to you first. Right? That, that the weight of the word of God is placed squarely on your shoulders, then you must take that and carry it to God's people. It's a burden. And it's often a burden because of the way in which it's received. Oftentimes, as the word of God, I know as I proclaim God's word, there are going to be people who laugh and mock and scoff and reject this word. This is what God told Isaiah, right? You're going to preach and nobody's going to believe. Nobody's going to listen. And this is exactly what we're going to see happen in the book of Malachi. 
Not that nobody's going to listen, but there's going to be questioning and doubting. God's going to speak. Thus says the Lord. And they're going to say, what? How? They're going to question again and again. There's going to be a, a pattern over and over here, almost eight times as we walk our way through where God's going to say, I say this, and they're going to say, how is that true? That can't be right. They're going to question God. They're going to question his word, or they're going to doubt his claim. You know, that's how sin entered the world. God gave clear rules, commands, right? Back in the garden, he said, don't eat of that tree. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. How did it all start? What does Satan say? You won't really die, right? I mean, surely that can't be, right? What, what, they question the word of God. And sin comes into the world. And things haven't changed a bit. Right? When it comes to the word of God, particularly when it comes to the word of God today, people approach it more like a la carte, right? buffet style. Right? Take what you like and leave what you don't. Right? I really like that love and life and joy stuff. I'll take that. But I don't really care for wrath and, and hell and, and rules and laws. I don't want anything to do with obedience. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So I'll take the life, I'll take heaven, I'll take joy, but I don't want anything else. That's how many people approach the Word. It may be the way that you are approaching the Word of God. <laughs> and so when, when God's Word is black and white over certain things and over certain areas, and God's Word is pretty black and white over, over sex and marriage and gender. And these are areas where people say, well, I don't know if that's quite right. I don't know if I believe that. Well, thus says the Lord. <laughs> we believe that God's word is true and authoritative. Right? We believe that God's word is inerrant and inspired, all of it. That his word is sufficient for life and for faith. But there may be some of you here, some of you listening, who would question God and challenge his word. And these are the people that Malachi is, is preaching to. He's going to say, thus says the Lord. And they're going to say, I don't know about that. I'm not so sure about that. And this is going to be a hard word. It's going to be a direct word to his people. And even though it's hard and even though it's direct, God begins his message with an important reminder. Notice the way he starts here in verse 2. Now we have our very first kind of declaration from the Lord. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Do you hear it? The question, the doubt. God makes the declaration and the people question it immediately. But I want you to hear God's word. Isn't it remarkable? Right? These people are cold and callous. They're doubting and they're disputing. And you would expect a harsh word of judgment. And God's going to speak, and he's going to speak directly and firmly, but to begin with, we hear his grace. And we see his love. I have loved you. You need to hear that this morning. We need to hear that this morning. God loves you. Do you believe that? It's in the perfect tense in the original language here, which means that when God says, I have loved you, he's not saying, there was a time in the past that I loved you, but now that you're acting like this, I don't love you no more. No, God's love is not, it's not based on what we do or what we don't do. When God says, I have loved you, it's a covenant love, a relational love, an unconditional love. In Jeremiah 31, 3, speaking to his people, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued in my faithfulness to you. Why does God love and why does he continue to love? Because he's faithful to himself. And he set his affection on this people. Will you hear the word of God to you today? I have loved you 
the creator, sustainer of the universe, loves you. The holy and righteous God loves you. Now, you might sit back and say, well, big deal. (laughs) God loves everyone. And that's true. There's a sense in which God loves everybody, right? He, he sends the sun on the wicked and the good, right? He gives his reign to the just and the unjust. There's a general way in which God loves all of creation. But this love is a relational love. There's a difference, right? I, you can understand that. As, as I, I can stand here and say, I love kids. I love kids. I do. But I don't love kids the way I love my kids. If I told my kids, you know, Abby, Emma, I love you girls just the way I love everybody, all the other kids in the world. How would they feel about that? Thanks, Dad. I mean, that's that's not what he said. Notice in verse 6, he says, A son honors his father. If I am a father, where is my honor, right? God is speaking to his people as a father speaks to his children. This is a relational love, a covenantal love, where he says, I love you, my people. So this is a word to those who are in him, in Christ. Yes, he's speaking to this people who are his chosen people, his covenant people, but to you and I today, to those in Christ, to his church, he would say to you, I have loved you. I have loved you. Now here's the question. How would you respond to that word? When God says, I have loved you, what should we say? I love you too, Lord. All right? Isn't that how you would respond when somebody says, I love you? But they say, how? How have you loved us? Now, I, I know this. If I'm talking to my wife and I say, honey, I love you, and she says, how? I know we got problems. <laughs> right? This is not good. Right? And, and this is what happens. God declares his love for his people, and they say, how? This is a slap in the face. <laughs> if, if you really love me, Lord, things wouldn't be like this. Right? They're looking at their current situation. They're looking at their circumstances, and, and they, they're not real happy with the way things are. Yes, they're back in the promised land, but this promised land doesn't seem so great. They're still under Persian control, right? The the king is still in control. They're they're ruled by a foreign power. They're not prospering financially, and we'll see that as we work our way through the book. In fact, when you come to chapter 3, verse 14, it says, It is vain to serve God. What what profit is it? It's not doing us any good to love you, God. It's not doing us any good to serve you. How have you loved us? So some of you this morning, perhaps, when you hear that word, I have loved you, some of you are, are here and I don't really feel that. I don't really see that. I don't know if I believe that. You ever been there? People are kind of afraid to be honest about that, right? <laughs> God says, you say you love me, but you took this from me. You took them from me. God, you say you love me, but why is this happening? Why am I facing this? Why am I going through this? Why are, why are we facing these struggles? God, you say you love me, but I don't see it. And that's what these people are doing. Lord, how can you say you love us? When, you know, if you loved us, then things would be better. And God, God doesn't slap them back. 
Don't you love that? Right. They, he says, I've loved you, and they just say, how? But God just graciously, patiently answers their doubting and their questioning. So, in verse 2, his response is somewhat surprising to us. He says, Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I, I'm, I'm guessing that's probably not what you expected God to say here. He says, I love you. And they say, how? And God says, well, remember Jacob and Esau? And you're going, what kind of answer is that? Right? I mean, he's, he's talking about these two brothers who lived thousands of years before. But, but notice, whenever God wants to encourage his people and reassure their hearts, he reminds them of his word. And, and, and so, yes, he goes back to these, these twin brothers, the sons of Isaac. And if you want to read about them, you could read about them in Genesis chapter 25. Right? So we're going back to the promises of God. Right? So God chose Abraham out of all the peoples on the earth. And Abraham right, had a son, Isaac. But he also had another son, Ishmael. And he chose Isaac to be the one through who this promised line would run. And Isaac marries Rebekah, who is barren, but she's going to have children. And notice <laughs> these two twin boys, even in the womb, they're fighting each other. That's, the, that's what we get in Genesis 25. The, str the children struggle together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. <laughs> now, you say, well, what, what's, what's he saying here, right? I loved Jacob, but Esau I hated, right? He's talking about two nations here that descended from Isaac, Israel and Edom. And in God's sovereign plan, he chose Jacob over Esau. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with these brothers, you really wouldn't want either one of them. But if you're going to pick, you might pick Esau. I mean, <laughs> Jacob was a liar, a deceiver, a cheat. And yet, and, and, and by every right, Esau is the one who deserves the blessing and the inheritance. He was the firstborn <laughs> by seconds. But he was the one who was, out, he was born first. And so he should have got the blessing. He should have got the inheritance. Everything should have run through Esau. But God says, what? How have I loved you? I chose Jacob. And if, if God had not chosen Jacob, if it were not for his sovereign choice, this people wouldn't even exist. They wouldn't exist. Listen, Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you. And is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers. Why does this people exist? Because God chose them. Because he set his love upon them. And so he says, they say, how have you loved us? And he says, is not Esau Jacob's brother? And the answer is, yes. Yes. His brother, the right, but God chose Jacob. What's the point here? The point is this. God could have just as easily chosen Esau as Jacob. <laughs> there was nothing in these two brothers that would have merited God to choose one and not the other. <laughs> there was nothing that said, Jacob, you deserve this, and Esau doesn't. God chose. God set his love and affection. And when he wants to communicate to his people now how he has loved them, he points to his sovereign election. How many of you saw that coming? 
I have loved you. How have you loved us? There's so many things he could have pointed to. He could have said, I delivered you out of, out of Egypt. I set your people free. I rescued you. I redeemed you. I provided for you day after day. I kept my promise. You were a great nation. You had a great king, but you left it all, right? And your idolatry, your rebel. But no, he doesn't point to any of that. He doesn't point to his grace. He goes back and he says, I chose you. I chose you. And the truth is this. If you're here this morning and you're in Christ, he chose you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, before the foundation of the world, he chose you. It's remarkable, right? That, that when God wants to communicate his love to his people, this is the way in which he does it. This is where he begins in eternity past. In the divine wisdom and counsel of God, he set his affection upon a people. And so now when they say, how have you loved us? Look at what's going on, Lord. If you have loved us. And he says, no, I chose you. I chose you. I set my love on you. You don't believe it? Listen, the Apostle Paul, he, he gives us New Testament commentary on this exact issue in Romans chapter 9. Listen to Romans 9 10, verse 10. Not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Whoa. He just makes it so clear. I didn't choose Jacob because of anything in him. Right? I didn't pass over Esau because of anything he had done. It was all, not, neither good or bad, right? It was all in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not according to their works. You say, why do you bring that out? Because God's sovereign election is not based on anything you or I do. I know that's really hard, right? Because right. a lot of people like to take this truth. Right? Everybody believes in election. It's in the scripture. We can't deny it. But they like to try and form it, shape it, maybe, maybe make it sense in their mind. And so they'll say, well, God chose me, yes, but he chose me because I would choose him. Because I would believe in him. It's kind of like God would look down and say, oh, look at Roger. He's so smart. <laughs> Right? He sifted through all those world philosophies and all those world religions, and he figured it out, and he chose me, so I choose him. Well, that's nonsense. He just said, I didn't choose them over anything they had done. If I'm the one who's so smart, and I'm the one who figures it out, then I get the glory. But I don't get the glory in salvation. God gets the glory in salvation. He chose not because of anything I had done, but according to his sovereign good pleasure. And I know there's some of you maybe wrestling with this this morning. You're going, well, isn't man responsible, right? Are we responsible to believe on Jesus? And the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Right? God's sovereignty in salvation never diminishes our responsibility. Listen to John chapter 11. John, or I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 11 familiar passage, right? He came to his own. His own received him not, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. How do you become children of God? By believing in Christ. But notice how that belief comes about. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Why did you believe? Not because you're so smart, but because God chose you. So those who are saved are saved because God chose them. And those who are lost are lost because they refuse to repent and believe on Christ. You say, how do you reconcile that? How do you resolve that? I can't. I can't. 
Paul calls it a mystery. Right? The secret things belong. I can't, I can't, I'm not going to solve that issue for you this morning, right? The, the, the sovereignty of God, the free will of man. But it's very clear. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. I've loved you. I chose you. And if you are his child this morning, it's because God chose you. Right? He says, you, I have chosen you. You did not choose me. No man comes to the Father except the Father draws him. But according to that sovereign choice, there comes a day in your life when you fall on your face, you recognize your sin, and you believe on Jesus Christ. I know it's not popular, right? And you might, you might hear me preach this morning, and you might say something like, you know, I'm just not sure about that, or I just don't know if I believe that. And you may be tempted to take this truth and take this doctrine and try and reconcile it and twist it and make it something that it's not. But I hope you understand this morning, when we come across this, this truth in the Scripture, it does create a tension. But it's never meant to cause us to question or doubt. It's always, always included in the scriptures, not to cause debate, but to bring delight to his people. Always. When you come across the doctrine of election, always meant to bring exaltation to God and encouragement to you. Isn't that what he's doing here? I have loved you. How have you loved us? I chose you. This is something that should encourage your heart this morning. You say, well, why did God choose me? I have no idea why God chose me. I know my heart much better than you know it. God chose me by his grace and no other reason. It's all by grace. You say, well, is that really fair? Is it really fair that God would choose Jacob and not Esau? You know what I always say, right? You don't want what's fair. Because if we got what was fair, then none of us would be chosen. If we got what was fair, every single person would perish. If we got what was fair. We don't want what's fair. We want grace. We want mercy. And that's what we find when we look at the scriptures here this morning. You say, why do I love God? Why do I know God? Why did I come to saving faith? Because he chose me by his grace. You say, well, what what happens to Esau? Well, look. Verse 3, I've laid waste to his hill country, left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. If Edom says we're shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. If they needed to be reminded of God's love, all they had to do was look at the nation of Edom. And they would be reminded of God's special love for them. Edom, right? That's the nation that comes from Esau. They will not prosper. (laughs) They will try, but they will fail. And you say, that's not fair. But notice, God doesn't bring judgment on innocent people. No, he's just in all of his dealings. This is the wicked country who he is angry with forever. And it's a, it's a somber reminder to us this morning. Those who are outside of Christ are underneath the wrath of God. And unless they turn, and unless they trust, unless they believe on Jesus Christ, they will forever be outside of God's love and under his wrath. Forever and ever and ever. You see that picture? That's what we deserve. That's what I deserve. And I know you're not going to like it, but that's what you deserve. But by God's grace... We hear that language, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, how do you know, pastor? How do you know who, who's chosen and who's not chosen? I don't know. God knows in his sovereign wisdom. What I know is I can say with all of my heart this morning, if you will believe, you will be saved. And if you believe in Jesus and you are saved, then God chose you from the foundation of the world. If this morning, through the proclamation of the word of God, you are fearful for your eternity, you are concerned about your salvation, and you feel God drawing you to himself, then respond. Respond. Turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Believe, and you will be saved. Listen to John 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You reject, you refuse, you do not fear, you do not tremble at his word, you will perish. You will perish. What's the point? What's the purpose here? Verse 5, your eyes shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. God's sovereignty over all of this brings him glory. God gets the glory in salvation. God gets the glory in his just retribution. God reigns. He reigns over Israel. He reigns over Edom. He reigns over everyone and over everything. And his glory is going to spread to the ends of the earth. And so he says, you will see this and you will say, great is the Lord. That should be our response this morning to this glorious truth. Great is the Lord. Beyond Israel. God's plans and God's purposes are for the whole world. And one day, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, we see a people gathered around the throne of God, looking at the Lamb and saying to Jesus, You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. When God sent his Son to die, Jesus died for a people but a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Great is the Lord beyond Israel. That includes you and I, if you know Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we see a vivid reminder of God's love for us this morning. It should humble our hearts. That's the point. I chose the weak things, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God says to you as his children this morning, I have loved you. I've loved you. I chose you. I set my affection upon you. This is not only humbling, but assuring to our hearts, is it not? If God chose me, then I am secure in Christ. Nothing can pluck me out of his hand. When I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast. This is why we can sing it as well with my soul. Because I am his. So yes, be encouraged this morning. Be, praise him this morning for this reminder. And not only are we reminded of his, his sovereign love as we look at the word, but as we come around the table and we partake of the cup and, 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 and the bread, we are we are reminded once again of his substitutionary, substitutionary sacrificial love. So we have multiple reminders this morning of this truth. I have loved you. As you eat and drink of the cup this morning, you are reminded that not only did God choose you, but he accomplished that redemption through his son. Right? The whole entire Godhead involved in our salvation. We saw that Wednesday night. And if you don't believe it, go read Ephesians 1 for yourself. To the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. That's the point of our salvation. And if our hearts are left anywhere else this morning, we've missed the point. 
as we come underneath the weight of the word of God, may we respond today in praise, in exaltation, in humility. As we gather around the table, let us not do so lightly. If you have sin in your life this morning that shouldn't be there, confess it, forsake it, get rid of it. If there are relationships that need to be reconciled this morning, if there's forgiveness that needs to be offered, then deal with it today. Because as we come before the table, we are reminded of the cost of our sin. That sovereign choice was free for God to make, but it cost him greatly. He purchased our redemption by the blood of Christ. And we rejoice in that this morning. Jesus paid it all. What was it? Jesus paid it? Not some. He paid it all. I'm going to give you just a moment to go before the Lord and prepare your heart to gather around the table, and then we will receive the elements. Let's pray.